Father, we just want to thank you again for all your goodness to us. And we want to reaffirm to the principalities and powers that we are in the fight, that we are people to be accounted for. And so, Lord, just open our hearts and ears and eyes this morning, our spiritual eyes, to see the things that you want us to see and to hear the things that you want us to hear, to equip us for our battle with this common enemy, this common foe. So, Lord, bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, can I just make an announcement that um, you probably know this by now, that there are tapes available uh, of all the seminars and all the main meetings. And um, here you'll find some order forms which you can fill in for audio or video uh, requirements. So do take one of these if you need them. And um, there are plenty more if these run out. Also, at the end of this time, we do want to uh, have an opportunity to pray with folks. But obviously... Um, it's going to be difficult to extend that into lots and lots of personal ministry, but you're probably also aware that there is a counselling tent um, here. This is actually at Marquee 10, and you can make appointments here to see folks. And um, if you find that you get alongside someone that hasn't been able to help you in that uh, counselling situation, then you can come back and you can be referred to others that perhaps are more experienced in the area that you're talking about. So do use the facilities. Um, they have been specially laid on so that um, you can spend time talking and sharing and really unburdening yourself and getting to the root of things that are troubling you. Uh, two o'clock this afternoon, four appointments. Um, is that from two till four? Or Yeah, okay, fine. Um, just, I want to just briefly recap or go over one or two things, there were one or two questions that came up at the end of our time. First of all, let me say that I believe God wants reality to come in to this area of deliverance and healing and the supernatural. Um, I think some of you may have picked up what I was saying last night, that there is a great deal of optimism around uh, when it comes to healing amongst some, and uh, we make all sorts of statements about the fact that we are healed, uh, or people will be healed, or we, we're in faith, and so on and so forth. I never forget in our fellowship once we prayed uh, for someone who was healed, uh, and were able to throw their glasses away, and they were completely healed in their eyes. And someone else immediately got hold of their glasses and broke them and proclaimed that they were healed as well. And um, quite honestly, it was... It was uh, devastating because people were leaping out of the back of her car as she drove along, you know, blind as a bat, sort of. People were rushing off pavements and diving out of cars and things. It was, it was terrible. And we had to really discipline her to put her glasses back on again because she was determined that she, she was healed. And um, whilst we realize that uh, on occasions that is right, that people need to walk in a word that God has given them, it is no good trying to get into a word by believing something. That's believism. And we don't want to get into that. The, the beautiful thing that we have is a promise from God. Um, you remember those three that walked in the fire? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Do you remember those three guys? When they were put under pressure to bow down to the gods of this world, they said, we refuse to bow down. We worship one God and our God will deliver us. That's what they said. But then they went on to say, even if he doesn't deliver us, we are still going to follow him and we will not bow down to you. And I feel that is the kind of attitude that we have, that we know that we are in a battle and that ultimately our God has provided a victory for our spirits, for our souls and for our bodies. And that ultimate victory is secure. There is nothing that can separate us from everything that God wants to give to us in every way. And we can be secure in that. We, we also know that our God wants to give us deliverance in our situation now. That he wants to invade this world with his healing power. But there is a battle on. And if at times we seem to be on the losing side, that's okay. Because we rest in the assurity that our God ultimately has everything in control. And that brings a kind of reality. There is nothing wrong. There is no... Uh, um, problem in being able to share where we're at in the, the matter of faith. 
And so I want us to come to a position where we are in faith in the ultimate of what God is going to do. And we are really seeking to see that ultimate brought in to our everyday life. So don't let's be afraid of really expressing where we're at in this matter of faith. If we get healed, praise God. If we don't get healed, praise God. We're going to go on with God, whether it's sunshine, whether it's rain, whether we're well, whether we're sick. Whatever happens, we're going to praise our God because he is worthy. And in that we can rest secure and we can know the peace of God in every situation. Paul said, I have learned to be content in whatever situation I find myself. And that wasn't a kind of passive contentment that sat back and didn't do anything about anything. But it was an active contentment that really went on to get everything that God wanted to give. Another matter that came up yesterday was the, um, the question of the ultimate sin. Uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Someone was saying that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. And uh, people were saying, can you ultimately be possessed or taken over by the devil in your spirit? Um, for me, the Bible isn't absolutely clear about this, and theologians argue about it. But what I want to try to explain is how I see blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin. Uh, to me, the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals to us God's answer. He reveals to us Jesus. He reveals God's salvation to us. And if you can get this picture of a drowning man in an ocean with someone standing on the bank with a, a life belt and they throw that life belt out to the drowning man in the ocean and he looks up at them and picks up the life belt and throws it back onto the bank and says, I don't want it, then in a sense that is the equivalent of the unforgivable sin. When the Holy Spirit comes to you and reveals to you G Jesus, and in your heart you know that Jesus is the answer to your problem, and you reject the Holy Spirit's revelation, and you go on rejecting it, then there is no other way of forgiveness. Do you understand that? Because the Holy Spirit has come and revealed to you the means of grace, the means of salvation. And you have turned aside continually and you've rejected that. Then eventually your heart becomes hardened and there is no other means of forgiveness. It's not that God is unwilling to forgive you, but it is that you have rejected the ultimate means of his salvation. And then, of course, there's that scripture in Hebrews chapter 5. I'll just read it to you. Which is a serious warning to us. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come, if they then commit apostasy, since they crucify the Son of God on their own account, and hold him up to contempt. And in other words, if one has come into fullness and have received fullness, and then turn aside from it and reject it, then there is no forgiveness. And again, I would stress that it is not that God is unwilling to forgive, but we actually crucify Christ again. We nail him to the cross and we say we do not want him. We will have nothing to do with this man in full knowledge. Do you understand that? And I believe that such an action is very, very rare. For those of us that have that kind of revelation... Um, and I think there are very few that have that kind of revelation. I would doubt whether there are many here, if any at all, that have come into the fullness that this is speaking about and rejected Christ. And we do find there are those who fear whether they have committed the ultimate sin. So what we were saying yesterday was that Satan is seeking to find weaknesses in our lives. And then he homes in on those weaknesses and he begins to use us like a puppeteer uses puppets. Uh, when I look back to my relationship with Christine, I used to find that in our marriage we would hit certain problems. Some of you have read our book and you know the difficulties we used to have in communication and um, how she would go silent on me and I would get steam coming out of my ears. And, um, you know, we'd go through this kind of process together. And it almost seemed as if the enemy had got a button in our lives. And that he could press this button and then we would go through a kind of spiral of events. And we, we had to come out the other end before we could start putting things right again. And he could sort of press that button whenever he wanted to. 
And I think that's what happens in our habits in our lives, in our lusts in our lives. Those of us that perhaps are in bondage to smoking or eating or whatever it may be. The enemy has got ground in our lives. And when he chooses to, he comes along and presses the button. And he, he says, cigarette. And so we put a hand in our pocket, we get our fag packet out, we take out our cigarette, we put it in our mouths, and we light it. We are controlled by him. And I want to say this morning that Jesus can help us to break that power. And that's what we want to talk a bit more about this morning. And so the enemy comes into our lives and gains control in our lives. And thus we become influenced by him. And it is just a question of degree. When we look at ordinary people like ourselves, then the degree is not very high, perhaps, in some cases. But when we look at the demoniac there that Jesus approached, who was cutting himself with stones, he was totally bound by the powers of darkness. But there was still that little area in his life that was able to come to the feet of Jesus and worship at Jesus' feet. And it was that ground that Jesus was able to come in on and set him totally free. And so we want to talk a bit more about that this morning. Christine, over to you. I want to talk a little bit about the forms that bondage can take. Um, I think it's very important for you all to understand... Yeah? Can't hear. Is that better? Right, sorry. He's taller than I am, I forgot. Um... I think it's very important for us as the children of God and as the people of God and as men and women of God, because that's who we are, to understand that there isn't any shame attached to having territory in our lives that the enemy stands on. There is no shame. That is what the enemy will tell you. He'll tell you to be ashamed. But there isn't any shame attached to it. If God highlights something for you during this time, then you start rejoicing that he's turned his light on it so that you can have that ground back. Because the enemy's desire is to keep you from having ground back which belongs to him. Now, to that end, I want to give my testimony at this point because um, I had an area in my life which was a no-go area for me. Now, yours may be different to mine, but I believe that the large majority of you have got a no-go area. An area in which you constantly get into trouble. An area which is a long-standing problem to you. That it's something that is always there. That it's something that has bugged you for years. Not something that happened just for the first time last month. But this is something that's been around for years. Now, mine was a particular relationship problem. I got on very well with most people. But there was one category of person that I really didn't get on with. I felt threatened, I felt under pressure, and I couldn't cope. And this has been going on for quite, well, as long as I can remember. And one day it came to a head. And the Lord, through John, challenged me. And John said to me, you've got to find an answer We can't live with this problem. I mean, he discipled me. He pinned me up against the wall and sort of slapped me around the face and said, you've got to get yourself together, woman. You know, Um, I'd been told to repent. I'd been told to choose. I'd been told to do this, that, and the other. And to the best of my ability, I had done those things. And I'd done some of them, in some cases, successfully. But there was still this churning inside of me when I came into a certain situation. So I went to God and I said, I have to have an answer, Dad. I can't live with this thing anymore. I need an answer. And I went to bed that night and I had a dream. Now this is how God did it for me. Uh, He might do it for you differently, but this is how he did it for me. And I had a dream. And in my dream, I was in this little valley. And it was a, a sort of very tiny plateau completely surrounded by hills. And it was a terrible place. It was absolutely awful. It looked, um, it looked as if it was volcanic or something. There wasn't anything green anywhere. Nothing was growing anywhere. And I was sitting on the floor of this valley. And it was really tiny, you know, um, just sort of about this big, the valley, just big enough for me to sit there with something else. And on the floor of this valley with me, there was this black box. 
And when I looked at this black box, I was absolutely terrified. I began to sweat. And I felt the Lord say to me, you have to open the box. Now, I'm the kind of person that even if it costs me, I'll, I'll do it once I've made up my mind to do it. So I opened this box and out flew this terrible bird. It was a black bird in color and it had a bill made of stainless steel. And it flew around the little valley and it seemed to know exactly where the roots of plants were. You see, there was nothing growing. I couldn't see any plants, but it seemed to know where the roots were. And it dug the roots out with this wicked bill and it ate them so that I knew that nothing eventually would be able to grow in that valley. I knew that. And I was, by this time, you know, I was in a right old state in my dream. I was also in a right old state in my bed as well, but I didn't know that at the time. You know, I was sweating in reality. And then the Lord said to me, if you want to be free, you have to look at the face of the bird. And I woke up. And um, the rest of that morning, I went about my sort of normal duties. And by lunchtime, I was desperate. And I said to the Lord, well, even if it kills me, and I've got a feeling it might, I'm going to look in the face of this bird. And I went up into my bedroom, and I sat down, and I said, okay, I'm ready. (laughs) And the Lord said, now, are you sure about this? And I said, I'm positive. And he brought the bird into the room, and I looked into the face of the bird, and it was the face of my dad. And until that moment in time, I hadn't realized how much my dad had hurt me. And for two and a half days, I had an experience of God reminding me of things that had really hurt me from my childhood. And at the end of that time, I was free. I was delivered. Call it what you like, but I was free. And now I find that when I get into a situation with those same people, I still find it a little bit of a struggle initially, At times, I find it a bit of a struggle. But underneath, there is not that reaction. I'm now dealing with um, habit and not something that has happened inside of me, deep down where I live. Now, I believe that there are things like that in most of our lives that we can't recognize. If you'd asked me before that experience, who do you love most, your mum or your dad? I would have said, oh, my mum. But you ask me that now, and I know it's my dad. I know it is. And I really love my dad. And the very first time I saw him after that experience, I felt the love for him well up inside of me. And I didn't say anything to him. I couldn't say to him, Dad, you really hurt me and I've forgiven you. Because my my dad didn't know he'd done it. My father hadn't thought up ways to torture me. He had just been motivated by the enemy. And there was ground in my life. And I'm really thrilled that God shone his searchlight on it. And that that ground I've reclaimed from Satan. So don't let him tell you that it's a thing to be ashamed of. It isn't a thing to be ashamed of. It's a thing to trample over ground like that. And to say, I'm going to have it back. You see, we're such strange people. We let the enemy get at us in such a variety of ways. Now, just this week... Um, I was in a conversation with someone and I'd had a a vision um, for some leaders and I'd seen what I thought were three broomsticks. And so I was saying, well, I was explaining to someone, I saw these three broomsticks and they said, oh, don't use that word. So I said, what, broomsticks? They said, oh, yes, don't use that word. And I thought, what have I said? Broomsticks. So I said, no, you're going to have to explain. What, What have I said? Well, they said, Witches ride on broomsticks. So I said, well, in that case, I'll have the word back from Satan. I'll have it back right now. And my broom has a broomstick. (laughs) And there isn't any witch that rides on it, other than me. (laughs) But there are things, beloved, if you think about it, there are things like that. Small things little patches of territory that you have given over to the enemy because witches ride on them. Think about them because they're evil. Are they? Are they evil? Or is it just that it's ground that Satan doesn't want you to have back? Are they evil? 
Or is it just that Satan has got you um, running around to his tune? Have them back. Have it all back. Don't leave Satan any ground. It's all ours. He, he hasn't got anything. Think about music. Think about art. Think about drama. Think about eating. Think about drinking. Thinking, think about breathing. Think about living. Think about making love to your husband or your wife. There isn't any ground that you can't have. And if there is any ground in your life that you feel you can't freely walk on, start examining it. Something may happen inside of you. You may begin to feel palpitations, but that's the enemy. That's not God. That's the enemy saying to you, whoa, back, you know, this is a bit of, you know, I mean, this has got nothing to do with being Christian. If you get that feeling, you have it back. You tell him that he is a squatter. He has no rights in your life. And whatever it is, have it back. Someone pointed out to me after the meeting yesterday, you remember I talked about the stooks of corn? And someone was pointing out to me that we do have the sort of equivalent in this country in the corn dollies. And there's something, you know, about corn dollies that has to do with ancient rights. Now, you may feel that we live in a country um, which is sort of free from mysticism and all of that kind of thing. Now, that is not true. There are so many things that we do. Take something that everybody sort of indulges in from time to time. Um, in Scotland, they call it first footing. Um, down south, it's just New Year. And my mother won't let you over the doorstep if you're fair and have got blue eyes. Not if you're the very first person in the New Year. She won't let you in. She won't let you in the house. You've got to be dark. And if you're fair, I don't know what would happen. Probably the house would fall down. <laughs> Or she thinks it would. And the other thing is that um, at New Year, um, have you got, do you know why you open the front door and then you open the back door? Do you know why you do it? It's to let out the old spirits and let in the new ones. Who wants them? You can live without them. You keep your door shut. But there are these kind of things. There's a lot of mysticism in our country. There in particularly as you get further up north, there's more and more. There's something called well dressing in certain areas around Nottingham, where they actually dress up the wells because they're the givers of water. They're not the givers of water. God's the giver of water, not this rotten old well. Please stop, Lord, we've had enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's taking me breath away <laughs> how about the things that we use at Christmas things like holly, mistletoe, ivy, laurel leaves why is it do you think that many of us only use them at Christmas time there must be some reason why women don't go out into their garden and pick holly at other times of the year and put it in vases why you don't uh, put laurel behind a flower arrangement. Well, I decided, you see, everybody kept telling me that mistletoe was the druids. And I thought, well, it's a plant. <laughs> um, and ivy was this. And um, laurel was that. And I thought, all right, then I'll just have it back. So I decorate fruit bowls with laurel leaves because they're nice and shiny and green and bright. And I put them in my flower arrangements. I've got a huge laurel bush in my back garden. I want it back. Do you see what I'm getting at? That where God touches you today, have it back. Don't walk round it and be ashamed. Don't think it's something you've got to cover over. Have it back, beloved, because God wants to set you free. He wants you to be a people of freedom. He wants you to be a people who are militant. He wants you to be a people who squeezes Satan right off this planet. Yes, I... Sorry. Oh. <laughs> it's my turn. Oh, you wound me up in the lead. <laughs> There's one very important one that I nearly left out that I would like to put in at this point. One of the areas where I feel that Satan has robbed us the most is in the area of our imagination. 
Now, very early on, we teach our children that imagination is a bad thing. Now, we have to draw a line. I would not allow this invisible friend to have a place at my table. You know, children do this. Now, some mums and dads actually set a place at the table for them. Now, I wouldn't go that far. I've taught my children that some things are reality, you know, touchable, and other things are imaginary and untouchable, and there are some things which are imaginary and are real. I mean, my children understood me. You probably don't, but my kids seem to understand me. Um, But now, in the area of our imagination, I'm given to seeing visions. Now, where do you think I see them? They don't run like a film on the wall, you know. I see them in my imagination. That's where I see them. And lots of Christians are really worried by imagination. Now, if you get it back from the Lord, and if you encourage your children not ever to lose it, if you show them that the imagination is a good thing, that it's somewhere where God can speak to you, it's where God can show you things. Some of the children in our church are in seeing seeing things, you know, they they see angels, um, and they see visions, and they are encouraged to do so. I mean, if we feel they're over the top, then we tell them that they're over the top, but we are trying to encourage them to take hold of their imagination and to use it to the glory of God. Now, I believe that most people are highly imaginative. I know some of you probably think you aren't, but I believe that you are. And sometimes God drops this little thing into your head, particularly if you are of an intuitive nature. And because it comes into your imagination, it comes in one side and you shoot it out the other. And I believe that that is the beginning of words of knowledge, words of wisdom, um, words of prophecy, seeing visions, and being able to um, be a prophetic person in your own right. That's where it happens for me, happens in my imagination. I don't see these words on a ticker tape, you know, across the wall. It happens in my imagination. And I feel it's a vital area for us to look at, particularly those of us with young children, and to get it in clear in our minds where to draw the line and where to encourage so that we bring our children up free. I don't want my children to not eat peas because I don't like them. I want my children to eat peas because they like them and not because I don't like them. I don't want my fears to be passed on to my children. And imagination is an area which is vitally important to the ongoing work of the Church of God, I believe. Uh, I think you begin to get the message. What we don't want is to create a people who are superstitious in reverse. Do you understand? Who are afraid um, of a bunch of corn or... Uh, are afraid of putting laurel leaves or having holly in their rooms. The question is whether that is meaningful to you in a wrong kind of way in your life. When we talk about the imaginations, some of you wonder what Christine is talking about. Some of you are like me. You switch on the screen of your imagination and it's blank. You know what I mean? And you look at it and you say, oh. Uh, uh. But um, I suppose all of us, to some degree, have an imagination. And it's an area that Satan can get in on. I prayed again, she says. (laughs) You'll notice I'm not carrying around an umbrella, though. I mean, I'm in real faith here. So if you haven't got a vivid imagination, nevertheless, you have an imagination. But there are many of us that do have imaginations and we have blocked them off because we it's been the area that Satan gets into our lives. We get afraid. He comes in and he conjures up pictures which cause us to be afraid. Now, what Christine is saying, that we want to take that territory for him and say, I open my imagination up to you, Lord. There's a scripture that says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind, actually the word is imaginations, are stayed upon him. When we open up our imaginations to God and let him show us what he can do and show us the things that he wants to say, then tremendous things can happen. Now, it's an area that needs to be judged. Of course it is. But many of you ladies, when you see someone, God speaks to you through your imagination. And he says something about that person, good or bad. And you push it aside and you say, I mustn't think that. Or if you do say it to your husband, 
um, he pushes it aside and you say, you mustn't think things like that. But I've begun to learn that when Christine comes to me with words like that, I have to give them serious consideration. I mustn't run my life on them, but I have to give them serious consideration. So let us take back our imaginations and give them to God and fix them upon him and open them up to the Holy Spirit that he may speak to us through our imaginations. And we'll find that many words of knowledge, words of prophecy and so on will begin to be released into the church in that way. Now, we're not all of the same ilk. Um, I have to confess that when it comes to discernment, I have the gift of non-discernment. And, and that can be very useful at times because it means that you don't see things and therefore you can say things that other people wouldn't say. I never forget, I went into a place uh, which afterwards, I think it, well, I it was Christine, someone told me it was full of religious spirits. Now, I didn't know that. And my partner and I went in there and he started playing his guitar and I started banging my tambourine and we started dancing and praising the Lord. And before we knew where we were, some of the young people were responding. And soon 500 people were doing a conga all over the place. And I believe that those religious spirits were driven out as a result of our lack of discernment. If we'd had discernment, we'd have been very upright, we'd have been very careful, and um, we wouldn't have done those kind of things. And fools were rushing in where angels fear to tread. God can also overrule your lack of ability. Um, You don't have to worry too much about it. If that's... (coughs) Thank you, Father. Rain makes things grow, doesn't it? Like patience. (laughs) Hallelujah. Don't worry about your lack of ability because God can work through you. You understand that? He works through you and your abilities. When I was in Norway once, um, we had a lovely little meeting with about six or eight couples. And... um, I, at the end of the meeting, one guy was left on the settee and he was sort of breathing deeply. He was going, (sighs) 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 and his wife looked at me very worried. I said, it's all right, don't worry, he's just resting in the spirit, he's just enjoying the Lord. And uh, so I said, just go and make some coffee. He's all right, just leave him alone. So he went, (sighs) 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 and he began to sort of keel over on the settee and she looked even more. I said, it's okay, don't worry, it's just the Holy Spirit, it's fine, you know. So she went off and began to make coffee. After a short time, his eyes began to disappear around the back of his head, you know, and he was going... <laughs> I said, no, it's, it's okay, it's just the Lord. <laughs> Shortly, he became as stiff as a board. This was about 20 minutes later, he was stiff as a board, you know, and sort of began to shake and quake. And I began to realise that it probably wasn't the Lord. <laughs> so I said... Uh, Oh, by the way, Graciela, it's not the Lord, it's, it's the devil. Uh, I just, a slight mistake here. So, by this time, the bloke couldn't move, you know, so I stood on his chest and I said, Can you hear me, Harlick? And I saw a flicker of eyelids, you know, and I said, It's okay, it's the devil, it's not the Holy Spirit, but we're going to deliver you anyway. So um, I said, Are you ready to cooperate? And his eyelids flickered again. I said, In the name of Jesus, get out! And slowly but surely, life came back into this lifeless body. And, um, you know, soon he was standing up and his wife was very relieved. And he'd been (laughs) delivered from a spirit of fear. So don't worry, you know. I mean, God (laughs) can meet with you just where you are. You can be a sort of uh, total idiot like me, sort of walking through life, not seeing these things. Um, Now we're talking about the marks of the enemy. And um, I want to... Just focus in on on one word in these three areas. One word that will help us is compulsion. How do we know when the enemy is at work in our lives? How do we know whether we're superstitious? How do we know whether what we're doing is a bondage or whether it isn't a bondage? Because some of you can go home and you can get rid of your books or get rid of your records or get rid of all your novels or whatever it is that you feel you're in bondage to. But really, it's not bondage at all. Some years back, I remember when I was just enjoying playing golf and my golf clubs used to stand in my study and I used to pray in my study as well. I always prayed with with one finger open, looking at my golf clubs, wondering whether God wanted me to give up golf or not. And as I was praying on one occasion, I heard this almighty yawn from heaven, you know. (sighs) And the Lord said, for heaven's sake, son, stop going on about your golf clubs. Get out there and enjoy the game. And when I ask you to give them up, I will tell you and you will know. Okay? So we don't want to get into areas of doubt and worry. God does not want us to be concerned about every little area. He will put the searchlight on things that he wants to give up. And the way that we can tend to know is compulsion. 
You know, when you wake up in the morning and you start polishing your golf clubs at half past six when you're only going to play at 12 o'clock, the likelihood is that you're compelled. You know what I mean? When you start looking at your golf balls and sort of polishing them and and, uh, playing with them on the carpet for hours on end, then you're probably into compulsion and God wants to deliver you. So the word is compulsion. Um, Let's think about bondage to materialism. When you're not thinking about anything else, what does your mind come back to? As I was saying, I'm driving the car of my life. When I got this car, it was, it was great. I enjoyed it. It was man and machine in perfect unity. <laughs> you know, we were sort of bombing down the, the motorway. And I've got, actually, the ultimate uh, mirrors. Not that you can just operate from the inside by an internal sort of uh, manual uh, sort of clip or something, but... We have electric switches that operate the mirrors in every direction. It's great, you know. I just love changing the position of the mirror without sort of doing a thing. It's really wonderful. So there, there I was with the car of my life. But the question is not whether I have it, because for two years I had no car at all. And very often in my life I've had, you know, sort of cars that fall apart at the seams. You know, when you bang the door, the exhaust falls off. You know, and when you put the exhaust back on, the door falls off and things like that. And... Uh, Uh, If you open up the bonnet, you know, and sneeze, bolts and things fall out, you know. And um, so it it isn't whether you've got one or whether you haven't. The question is whether that thing occupies your thinking, whether it possesses you, whether you can be content to have it and content not to have it. I think I mentioned this scripture that Paul says that he had learned to be content whatever situation he was in. And that is where God wants us to come to, where we really know that what he has for us is the very best and that he is not trying to deprive us but that he really wants to bless us and whether he gives us things or whether he takes things away it is ultimately for our good and for our blessing and if you're any any doubt about that go back to the book of Job we haven't got time to talk about it now but see that when God took away apparently everything from Job it was in order that he might bless him and bring him into a position where he could give him back double do you understand that? And the ultimate story, or the end of the story in Job, was that God gave back Job twice as much as he ever had before, because he put him into a position where he could really bless him. And it seems to me there are some Christians who are in bondage to materialism, and there are some Christians who are in bondage to asceticism. And um, we moved into one house some years ago, it was a derelict house, and there are a lot of OMers there, and Christine said, oh, she said, uh, I can bring the woman's touch. I can put a few sheets on the bed and, and uh, you know, wash the sleeping bags, you know, and things like that. And uh, instead of just Marmite and peanut butter, we can have jam and, you know, we can have other things like that and cream. And, and uh, some of these guys were actually unable to do that. They refused to have sheets in their beds when they could have them. They refused to sleep on a mattress when they could sleep on the floor. They were in bondage to that kind of attitude. And that is equally wrong. God wants to deliver us so that we are free either to enjoy things or to give them up. We're in harmony with the will of God. So God wants to deliver us from materialism. And we can begin to tell whether we're in bondage to that by this compulsion. When our mind is at rest, where does it go? What does it focus on? Is there something that is occupying our thinking, some desire that we have, a home, a kitchen, a car, or whatever it is, um, wealth, position, power, whatever it is. Secondly, bondage to the flesh. We can be motivated by our appetites. I really wish we had lots of time to spend on this because there are many young people here and there are many people who have been taught by innuendo concerning the appetites of our flesh, particularly in the sexual areas. And many of us try to get forgiveness from God for things that he doesn't want to forgive us for. God gave you your sexual appetite. You need to bring it to him and find out what he has to say about it. Okay? And it will be different for all of us. The scripture said that there are some people that are born eunuchs. There are some people who are made eunuchs by men. And there are some people who are eunuchs for the kingdom of God's sake. In other words, they've chosen to be eunuchs. And God has got something different to say to each one of us. And there may be some people that can lay aside their sexual appetite. They come to terms with it in such a way they can completely lay it aside. And they can go on with God in a way which others cannot. And so what is good for one is not good for another. And if I had time, I would really like to talk about sex and the single person. But it's not the place to do it. All I would say is... Don't just learn by innuendo, by pressure, by taboo, either from society or from the church. 
Find out what God says about sex. Find out what the Bible says about sex. Particularly things like masturbation. I challenge you to come to terms with it. Because we have to bring our appetites to God. And we don't have to crucify our appetites. We have to bring them so that he can sanctify them. And the scripture says, let your moderation be known to all men. God is not looking for a people who go around and are holy because they don't do a series of things. He is looking for people who have their appetites in control. In other words, they are not motivated by compulsion. They are not driven in their appetites. Now, there are certain areas where Christians are very sensitive. You know, we're... we're we're horror-stricken about drugs and about alcohol and about some of these other issues. But I have never yet found Christians that have started a mission to gluttons. And yet, actually, when you come down to it, more people are dying or are seriously ill as a, as a result of wrong eating than that there are in drugs and alcohol put together. In fact, it's probably one of the, the biggest uh, causes of disease and fatality in the West. Okay, so now I don't want to bring us under condemnation about our eating. But what I want to say is let's bring our appetite to God and say, Lord, I want to enjoy my eating with you. I want you to sit at table with me. I want you to help me learn to use my appetite so that it can bless me, so that it can, I can enjoy it, and so that it can be a, a, a part of my everyday life. So that I'm not always thinking about the results of what I eat, and I'm not always... Uh, feeling compelled to have to eat things that I don't want to eat, but I'm at harmony with my body and with God. And God can bring us to that place. I wouldn't say I'm absolutely there, but I would say when I look at what God has done in my life in that area, I, I am really thrilled because eating is something that I enjoy. And I find that God is able to be with me in my enjoyment. And perhaps many of you here are struggling in that area. God wants to begin to speak to us that he wants temper and with various other things uh, God wants to come in just think about temper it's not that God wants to change your personality completely do you understand that the day that I read that scripture that says be angry and sin not I realized that God wanted to get hold of my temper so that he could come in and use it he didn't want to annihilate my personality and make me a kind of spiritual zombie that went around being sweet to everybody and being nice to everybody. My wife used to say, you're nicer than God at times. It's not you. And I got delivered. And I remember when I lost my cool, with, I didn't actually lose it, but I allowed myself to be angry with a brother. And he looked at me with, with tears streaming down his cheeks and he said, oh, John, he said, now I know you love me. I said, what on earth do you mean? I said, I've just got angry with you. He said, you only get angry with people that you love. He suddenly realized that he was part of the family, that he was included in. And so it's not that God wants to annihilate our appetites and make us kind of passive people, but he wants to come in and control our appetites and to use them for his glory. Uh, finally, bondage to religion. And in that, I include bondage to politics, bondage to philosophy, cults, occult, superstition, humanism. Do you know, humanism has invaded the church. When we think that we can accomplish God's ends by our efforts, that is a kind of humanism. Do you know that? And if you go, go back home as a result of Festival 85 and decide that you are going to evangelize your area, if you do that in your own strength, that is a form of humanism. And we can get trapped into that. It's very easy for us to be trapped. Superstition. Religious superstitions, evangelical superstitions. How many people, when they sit at the wheel of their car, feel that they cannot drive off unless they have pleaded the blood of Jesus over their journey? Now, I have no problem with praying, but I do have a problem that fits with someone who feels that if they don't do it, something evil is going to happen to them. People who read the Bible in the morning and feel that if they don't, they will have a bad day. That is Christian superstition. You need to be delivered from that. After a session like this at Spring Harvest, someone came up to me and he said, Brother, before I go out in the morning, he said, every morning I have to put on the whole armor of God. If I don't, something will happen to me. And uh, so he put on the helmet of salvation. He went through this every morning. He said, do you feel that I'm in bondage? I said, undoubtedly you are. He said, what should I do? Well, I said, I suggest that when you go to bed at night, you leave it on. <laughs> I said... said you might rip the sheets but uh, 
you're just as vulnerable at night as you are during the day. So, so did you understand what I'm getting at? I have no problem with someone that joyfully puts on the whole armor of God every day. Do it, fine. But when it becomes a compulsion and you feel that you've got to do it in order to please God, that is a religious superstition. In actual fact, we are giving place to demons. And there are many Christians who are acting out and doing things, thinking that God is pleased, when really what God wants is your heart. He doesn't want some outward action. So can you understand that? Uh, Politics. I believe many Christians need to be delivered from the belief that their political persuasion is the right one, and they want to put that on others. Do you understand that? That God is not left-wing or right-wing. In fact, there is a scripture to prove it. He said, when you would turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it. God is middle of the road, and that's not SDP either. (laughs) A severely depressed person. (laughs) Now, if God wants you to work in a political party, then by all means do that. But we know that the government's going to be on his shoulders. And what I want to see is Christians who feel called in every area. Because if we can get Christians in every party that are actively involved because God has called them to be there, then there's going to be a glorious holy confusion. Do you understand? I mean, the, 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 the House of Parliament, the, the, the House of Commons is, is going to become a complete confusion because people will be standing up and saying, after you, my friend, you know. Um, no, please, honourable brother, do speak before me. What you had to say was tremendous. I can't really disagree with it. You know what I mean? And while we have the opportunity to be involved in these areas, we need to get in. But political fanaticism is being in bondage to religion. It is worshipping evil spirits because those spirits govern the extremes of those ideas, philosophies, and so on. And God wants to deliver it as from it. And you can tell whether you've got a compulsion. When you begin to, someone, begin to talk to someone who's different to you, something wells up within you. And you begin to feel that you've got to defend your position. You need to bring that to God because there's nothing to defend if you're in him. He wants you to come to peace with yourself, with, uh, with these areas. Christine. Sorry. Not Christine. Oh, okay. Hello. She wants to speak when uh, it's my turn, and now when it's her turn, she <laughs> doesn't want to say, typical woman. Never mind. <laughs> right. Let's sort of move on and begin to be practical and say how... Do we get free? How do we get free? There's a lovely scripture that says, the truth will set you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I think many of us think of Jesus in terms mainly of love. Uh, or should I say grace? Probably grace is a be- better word. We, I had that little picture of Jesus in my nursery with all those creepy crawlies over him. You know the one with the white gown, the little squirrels and caterpillars and things all around his ears you know it was really nice and you grow up with this sort of image of Jesus but that is only one side of Jesus the other side is that he went into the temple and he turned the tables over Jesus the glory of Jesus was that he was full of grace and truth now the truth is not words we I don't know if you watch horror films some of you probably don't I do actually because they amuse me now I'm not advocating that people watch horror films in fact a lot of people ought not watch them but most of them I find amusing and I enjoy watching them Um, now that may shock you and if you want to talk to me about that afterwards do fine but um, when you see these films you know when sort of Dracula comes in sort of like this you know somebody rushes to the corner of the room and gets their bible out their NIV you know and holds it up to in front and sort of Dracula goes you know Because this is the truth, you know, and the truth is going to set us free. I want to tell you that this, Satan reads this. He quotes it. He uses it. He opens it up every day and reads it, and he comes back at people with Bible verses. Isn't that what he did with Jesus? If you are the Son of God. He knew the Bible. He knows it well. So it isn't just these words. It's no good repeating the 23rd Psalm, you know, when Dracula comes into your bedroom. That isn't going to do you any good unless you know the reality of it. So the truth is not mere words. The truth is a person. The truth is Jesus. 
and it's Jesus that sets us free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And Jesus comes and brings his revelation into our lives. And as we open ourselves up to his grace and his truth, then we shall be set free. Recognize the truth, particularly about three areas. First of all, about yourself and your sin. Now, I find that Christians know the theory of this, but they haven't really opened themselves up to it. You could not be worse than you are. I wish all Christians could have an ultimate disappointment, you know, with themselves. An ultimate disappointment. People keep on being surprised that they can do things as bad as they've done. Well, I never thought I was as bad as that. Do you know what I mean? I never realized that it was like that. And most Christians would say, if you say to a group like this, do you believe you're perfect? I don't suppose there's one person in the room that would actually say, yes, I am perfect. Unless they were talking about the perfection that we have in Christ, that we are not yet perfected. There are still areas of our lives. And yet, when you start telling people where those areas are, then they begin to react. And that's really sad, isn't it? Now, we need to open ourselves up to the Lord and say, Lord, put your searchlight into my life. I went to a place called Auschwitz. I was walking around the camp there, looking at human hair to a depth of six feet that was still there, taken from bodies, piles of wooden legs, of false teeth, um, rolls of parchment-like looking material, which I discovered was the skin that had been peeled from bodies in order that the Nazis could make lampshades and uh, leather straps and, and uh, wallets and book covers and things like that out of human skin. And the whole thing began, I think two million people were incinerated in the gas, in the gas chambers and the, the fires of, of Auschwitz. I felt deeply distressed. The sun was shining, strangely enough, uh, but the birds weren't singing and you could almost smell the stench of burning flesh. It was a strange kind of, of feeling. And as I walked around there, I found myself saying, Lord, am I? a member of the same race of beings as the men that committed these atrocities. And I heard a voice from heaven in my heart saying, yes, all the seeds of sin were in you, the same seeds that were in the men that committed these atrocities. Only the ground was different. Your background, your family situation, your parents, and so on and so forth. The ground was different. But given the right circumstances, all the seeds were there, and they could have grown to their fullness in you. And then I heard the Lord saying, and furthermore, I died for these men just as much as I died for you. And suddenly my salvation became so much more precious to me. I understood what Paul meant when he said, I am the chief of sinners. And beloved, you'll get through an awful lot of problems when you realize you couldn't be worse than you are. Paul wasn't the chief of sinners. I am. I'm not. You are. You rotten lot. (laughs) We are totally depraved. We are totally without help when we are separated from Christ. But the other factor about us is that we are also absolutely unique. God has created each one of us like precious flowers. And in this room right now, my imagination suddenly has come alive. It doesn't often, but it's suddenly come alive. And I see a crop of really beautiful flowers in this room, budding, responding to the sunlight of God's love. And you are unique in him. And that's the fact of the matter. That Paul, who knew that he was the chief of sinners, could also say, I am the chief amongst the apostles. He could come to terms with the blessing that God was pouring into his life. And I believe those two facts, the truth about who we are outside of Christ and who we are in Christ, is going to bring release to us. You are unique in him. We also need to understand... Secondly, about the devil and his devices. Now, we've talked a lot about that. I don't particularly want to go on there. But please realize constantly that when you are in a struggle, you are not fighting flesh and blood. You're fighting an enemy. Constantly divert your attention away from the immediacy of the thing. You know, the fact that there's not enough room in the caravan and the gas bottles run out and the caravans leak in any way or the tents or whatever it is. Divert your attention and realize that the enemy is utilizing every circumstance of life to get at you so that your soul becomes uh, controlled by him. And then begin to divert your anger and your frustration at him in Jesus. Okay? And you'll begin to find that you get release. Uh, Finally, realize the truth about Jesus and his power to save. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And some of us need to begin to confess this much more with our lips. You understand that? 
that confession, believing with the heart, is not enough. Confessing with the lips is also important. And I find myself more and more under the oppression of the enemy as I seek to do God's will. But I find myself confessing more and more the truth that I know in my heart. Now, you don't have to know the Bible from cover to cover. All that you confess is that which you know. I was attacked. After one act of deliverance, I I won't tell you the whole story, but there was one serious case of a guy who thought he was the uh, angel Gabriel. He was a friend of ours, and he began to become proud in his spiritual experience, and he began to pray with some old ladies. He began to think he was specially called by God, and eventually he came to the place where he thought he was the archangel Gabriel. And um, he went into mental hospital and he broke out of mental hospital. And one day I was preaching in a meeting and they came in and said, can you pray for this lad? And I went home with him and I prayed for him and he was completely delivered. In about three or four hours, he was absolutely normal. And his mother cried out and said, oh, she said, I've got my David back again. And I went home completely drained of all my spiritual resources and I sort of relaxed and I, I didn't cover myself. And I went to bed, it was about four o'clock in the morning, I said, well, praise the Lord, I was absolutely elated, but I had no more resources left. And just after I would got to sleep, the telephone rang again. And in a moment of time, that boy had gone right back, completely back to where he was. He'd been delivered for a few hours, and he went straight back to where he was. And you know, that hit me like an arrow, right in the heart. And something entered in at that time. And for six whole weeks, I battled with fear, irrational fear. I laid in bed and I was afraid. I got up in the morning, I was afraid. I got in the car to drive and I was afraid. And the only way that I found I could overcome that was to constantly proclaim the truth that I knew in my heart. I couldn't pray, couldn't read my Bible. I didn't want to go to the prayer meeting, didn't want to go to meetings. What I did was just constantly to proclaim the truth that Jesus Christ in me is greater than he who is in the world, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin, that my salvation is secure in him, that nothing can separate me from the love of God. And as I went on, that fear began to lift, and I knew that I had done battle with an enemy. He was going to come back and have another go, but I now had the better of him. I had my foot on his neck. He might wriggle from time to time, but I was in the ascendancy, not because of me, but because of the goodness of God. They overcame by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and that they love not their lives unto death. And I want to encourage you to confess the reality and the truth that you have. However small you feel your faith is, you don't need much faith. You only need as much as a grain of mustard seed. You have all the faith you need to be able to do battle with the enemy. So confess the truth. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you want to say anything? (laughs) Um, I just feel that I'd like to sort of break right in here. I know we haven't quite finished the speaking bit. Um, and I, I want to pray, first of all. I want to invite the Holy Spirit to move amongst you and to do a work amongst you now. So I'd like you just to put all your things down on the floor, actually. And I know in my heart, this is, this is where my faith rises, that there are people here today who God is going to set free. He's going to deliver you from the things that are holding you down. So if we can just pray together, first of all, just to invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and to do your work amongst these people. To do your work in our hearts to do your work in my heart. O Lord, send your comforter to people who are bereft. Send your comforter to people who know that they're sinners. Send your comforter to people who know that there are areas in their lives that they need to be set free. Send your comforter to deal with those things now, Lord, by your Spirit. And now what I would like to invite you to do is I would like to invite you to stand, those of you who want to respond. Now, I don't want there to be any pressure, but I do want you to think back to what I told you. I think I told you last session. And I want you to have this picture in your mind, that as you stand on that piece of enemy territory, as you stand on it, 
as you stand to say to the principalities and powers that you are actually going to have it back, that that is when the angels draw their swords. That's what I want you to have in your heart and in your mind, in your imagination. Open your imagination just a little and see that angel now with his hand on the sword hilt ready to do battle for you. And I want you to stand. I want you to stand, first of all, for those people to whom God has already revealed the ground. Just stand. Stand on it. Yeah, God has actually spoken to you already. Those are the people I'm talking about. You know your ground and you're not ashamed. What you want is you want it back. You're not ashamed. You just want it back. And you're going to get it back, beloved. And now I would like you to stand for a category that we haven't actually touched on. But I feel there are some of you who are in real fear and phobias. I think there's somebody here who's afraid of birds of insects, of germs, of the dark. Don't be ashamed. Just stand. Just stand. Have it back. Don't let the enemy tell you to be afraid of standing. You have that ground back. There are people probably, I think, possibly more women than men, who are afraid of the aging process. Have it back. There's nothing to be worried about in getting old. The older you get, the nearer you are to meeting with him. Hallelujah. So have it back. There are those of you who are afraid that you've brought your children up badly. Well, you can't do anything about the past, but you can do something about the present. You stand. Have that ground back. No longer be afraid of what you've done to your family and to your children. There are those of you who I believe have a real phobia about shutting things and locking things up. You know that you have to sort of go round and keep checking up on things. Checking up that you've collected all the washing together and you haven't lost a, left a sock in a basket somewhere. It doesn't matter if you've lost a sock. You can wash it all on its own. God doesn't mind. But the enemy wants to tell you that it's wrong. Right. Now I would just like to pray for you now. To ask the Holy Spirit to do a work amongst you. There isn't anything that I can do, but the Holy Spirit can take this from you. He can Now, I want you to be ready to give it to him. Just give it to the Holy Spirit and start rejoicing in the ground that you've won back from the enemy today. Father, Lord, I see the enemy and I rejoice in that. But I rejoice more in that I see the heavenly host. And Lord, I ask you now, because I know it's what you want to do, unleash the heavenly host upon the enemy for our sakes, Lord, and set your people free. Hallelujah. By your spirit. Praise your name. Enemy, be gone from these people's lives. Leave them alone and touch them no longer. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jesus, we just ask that your Holy Spirit will move in onto that territory. We just pray that the peace of God will begin to invade that area where there has been confusion or fear or phobia, Lord Jesus. And we just ask that we shall begin to see a glorious change in many of our lives, as if the clouds begin to dispel and patches of blue sky come through, Lord Jesus. We really want to see the sunlight of your love coming to those dark areas of our lives. So as we drive the enemy out, we invite the Holy Spirit to come in and possess those areas and to occupy those areas in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now do be seated. Um, can't read that. Can you read that, love, and tell me why you do it? I can't concentrate. Um, just, I just want to say something, um, a word of explanation. I think it's very good that Christine prayed at this point. 
And um, again, I want to come back to my optimist's realist thing. There, there are two ways in which God moves in our lives. One is through crisis, and the other is through process. And I find that there are many saints... Don't let's lose our concentration here, because I think it's important. There are many saints who are all crisis and no process. And there are others who are all process and no crisis. And I think if you look at Christine and I uh, in our extreme forms, I'm all process and she's all crisis. I'm all for choosing to do the will of God and holding fast unto God and seeing territory gradually brought back under the kingdom of God. And she's all for getting it dealt with overnight. Now, the danger is that we would pull apart because we see the weaknesses. She sees that some people never get set free by process alone. I see that some people who have a crisis just go back to what they were. Now, what we need to see is that God has both of these modes of operation in our lives for all of us. And it's not just the crisis, it's not just the process, but both of these things need to operate in our lives continually. And so some of you may have had a crisis experience today. Well, you need to stand on that ground now. That's what Ephesians 6, 10 and onward says. It says, having put on the whole armor of God, what do we do? We don't wrestle and fight and struggle, and, and, but we stand. There's a, a lovely word in the Psalms that says, David says, the Lord takes my right hand. Now, David was a man of war. What did he hold in his right hand? His sword. What does that mean? It means that God takes the sword out of your hand and fights for you. The battle is the Lord's. And so what we have to do is to come to God, we have to stand on that territory, and he will fight for us. It isn't us wrestling. And sometimes we wrestle, but Paul says we wrestle to enter into our rest. God wants us to come to a place of permanent rest in these things, to give ourselves over to him, to know that we can't change ourselves. We can't make it happen. But as we constantly yield, 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 give ourselves to God, stand on that territory, then we find that God comes into our lives and the process takes place. So let's rejoice in the crisis and let us go on with the process and let us not be afraid of utilising both of those aspects of things. There are other things that we could say. Was there something that needs to be said there? Um, I've got a a little question here. um, That... Do you think that the last example, you know John spoke about the man who went back on what had happened to him, um, that the demons can come back after they've been thrown out. That's the question. Can demons come back after they've been thrown out? Well, the answer to that question is yes. The scripture says that clearly, doesn't it? That if we sweep the house, but we don't invite the Holy Spirit in. um, Now, I don't want to get bogged down in the particular case that I spoke spoke about. Every case is different. But the important thing, I think, really, is what I'm saying is that having had a crisis, that we go on in the good of that, not by our own strength, but that we continually invite the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we do go back on things, um, we can come again to the Lord. This is the truth of the matter, isn't it? How many times can we come to God? 77 times 7. Does that mean 400 and... No, sorry, how many? 70 to 490. Right. Right. Does that mean four? No, it doesn't. It means infinity because seven is the number of perfection. Seventy times seven is infinity as far as God is concerned. You can come again and again and again and again and he will constantly forgive you. What happens is that as you draw upon his love, as the abundance of grace begins to infect your life, you become stronger and stronger and stronger. And in your weakness, you are made perfect in your strength. Okay? So it's by being open. Now, Christine didn't mention, I'll close with this, but the sexual problems that I mentioned, some of you are struggling with sexual problems. And you you need to bring them to God. You need to be really open with God. You need to... Some of them stood. Okay. You also need to be open with people that you can trust. Be wise, but you need to share your heart with others. Confession is good for the soul. I'm not talking about details. I'm talking about general things that you are involved with. And you need to find out what God is saying. And I really want to encourage you to go through the process of bringing your sexual emotions to God and getting them under his control so that they can be released in a right way for his glory. Because we don't want a lot of Christians that are going around holding banners saying porn is, is evil if we cannot supply the world with a viable alternative. Do you understand that? We want to have marriages 
lives of single people that are balanced and that can say to the world, this is what God has to say about this subject. So that was another area that I think we not only need the crisis perhaps of deliverance in certain areas, but we also really need the process of understanding God's heart in it. So um, I just want to pray with uh, folk who are bugged in that way before we go. Father, we just want to bring this particular area to you. I feel it's so important in the church. So many married couples have got married without having anyone to counsel them. Others have been infected by innuendo. Single people have not really felt that they're allowed to unburden themselves and they feel God has given them a gift on the one hand and then said, don't use it on the other. And they don't know how to react in your presence. And Father, we come to you and we say, deliver us, Lord, from misconceptions. Deliver us from misunderstandings and bring to us your peace in this area of our lives that we might be people that can come to terms with the precious gift that you have given to us in this way. I just ask that you will specifically bless certain people at this moment. Take away the burden of guilt and help them to understand that you care. You're not standing back away from them, but you want to be involved in this issue that they're struggling over at this moment in time. So bless, so release. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. And don't forget the counselling tent um, is open at two for appointments, and if there are those that need, then do come. Thank you for being in the seminar. The Lord richly bless you.